Well, for those of you who don't know me, I am Anirudh. I have a PhD in physics. I then went to business school after I realized I don't want to be a professor. And now I'm telling a bunch of companies what they should do about things I know nothing. So basically they are depending on me for my advice. All that I have is confidence. So, uh, but they still seem to buy it. So I'm giving them more and more advice. But also uh, I, uh, I was a student at some point during my PhD. And then there were a bunch of people who had Krishna lunch and they're like, ah, oh, $6 food. I'm like, oh, this is a scam. And then I was like, oh, but this is actually nice. And I started hanging out with them. And I thought, oh, it's so that's like a very quick intro. Odds are if you're at the blurb that comes with a headshot and emails, you would, but then who is email right? So I figured I should introduce myself one time. All right. So if you got a chance, the topic that we are talking about is finding your people. Uh, so let me like kind of <clears throat> let's give some context and then we can kind of talk about a few things. So some of us were here about five weeks ago when I spoke about overconsumption, how much is too much, overaccumulation, and things like that. Now, the same person, Rupa Goswami, who came up with like, oh, overconsumption, you know what, let's not even worry about writing anything. So the same person, Rupa Goswami, who said that overaccumulation is a problem, actually pointed out that there are six different things that are not nice to have as a spiritualist. They kind of are blockers in our journey, if you will. One of them was over accumulation. The other thing that he said was association with worldly minded people. That was the one. And or in Sanskrit, he said Janasakha, <coughs> which was associating with people who may not share similar values, similar goals. They're not really trying to pursue bhakti. And he says, avoid them. Not a good idea. They could be problematic. And so that got me thinking like, okay, if these people are problematic, then what do I do? Do I avoid them altogether? Do I find some intermediate balance? Da, da, da. And so I figured, okay, then maybe we should talk a bit about why this is a problem, what we could do about it, how this fits into a spiritualist journey, etc. That's kind of the goal. Does that make sense? And as I said before, I'm not very good with facial expressions. Yes, no. Uh, things like that work better for me. If something doesn't make sense, let me know. If things are making sense, also let me know. The encouragement is on somebody. Can you talk? I mean, I, the great irony of my life, as I said before, is that I'm a consultant. The whole stereotype is that we are very good at PowerPoint. We make really good pages, and I run away from them as much as I can. So we are all going to do talk. And maybe I'll try the thing or two. And if you have questions, I'm trusting you to ask. Okay. Good. That sounds okay. All right. Ah, well, thank you. It's not so hard with it. Okay. So, why is like if you're a spiritualist, say you started thinking a bit about bhakti, you've been to the temple a few times, these beads you've started to chant on them, or maybe you're not, whatever it is, you're at some stage in your journey, in your spiritual journey, and then someone says, you know what, keep the right company, try to avoid all these other kind of people. Why would they say that? Like, what could be some problems? First of all, do we need to avoid them? Like, that's a fundamentally different question. But to start with, how many times did we do things because we, are, we were peer pressured into doing them? Do people have stories, thoughts? Or are we all like super, super perfect? And we're like, yeah, you know, you can say whatever you want, but I am very clear in what I want to do. And I refuse to get influenced. Happen conversations where people do. Okay, so conversations you could get peer pressure into something. You're not doing something like general, small, small. I would say you won't engage in certain conversations or certain way of speaking, but you might do that under certain peer groups. Mm -hmm. So I put on a mask. Not right. mask exactly. I would say you would do that just because they are there. Like they are doing it so that you're otherwise you might not even think about. It. So if I had to capture that, I would say fit in, yes. Fit in, right? No, no, that's agreement. Okay. It was the Indian. It was the Indian agreement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
this is yes, this is no. For us, this is yes, and this is also no. <laughs> so it's a little hard, but so fitting in, that's the problem, right? Sometimes we do things that we don't want to do, or, or we say things that we wouldn't have said in other situations because we are in a certain group of people, right? That's a bit of a problem sometimes, at least. So I think you had your hand up. So it was peer pressure. You were peer pressured? Planning is here. Whatever he says doesn't matter anymore. The wife is always right, right? We all know that. So whatever she said, we take that as gospel. So that's how that works, right? Karthik is reluctantly, he's doing the Indian nod on this one. He's like, yes and no. Anyway, but, but it's an interesting point, right? So it doesn't always have to be that fitting in can be a problem. Sometimes it can be good too. But the basic idea is that the people we are with, they can influence us, right? There is some amount of influence that our company exerts on us, which can be good or bad. And so it's very important to think about who we hang out with. So that's one. What are some other things? Like, why would you want to be very careful about who you who you hang out with? Maybe as a spiritualist or even in general, right? Like, forget about the spiritualist journey. Why is your company so important? Why is it that the people you are with is important? What else? Habits from others or traits. Uh, depending on who you're hanging out with, you might pick up some traits that are not so favorable for you, both health wise, Not exactly what you said, but I'm happy. Right? We we see, and then this can potentially influence us. Okay, that's one. One that I experienced personally, like especially with respect to like spirituality, is that sometimes get lost. And what I mean by that is, so especially when I first started like learning a little bit about Krishna consciousness, about Vaishnava philosophy, it all seemed very interesting to me, but it didn't fully make sense to me. And so I am in the state, I was in the stage where I didn't really understand what was going on, but I knew this makes sense. And so then my parents, so I was an about atheist by the time I met devotees. And I was like, you know what, God is a construct. I, in fact, very distinctly remember uh, there's this person I really look up to now, and we were there in this mantra meditation, similar to what you all do, Kirtan. So I was sitting in one of these Kirtan sessions, and uh, we did Kirtan for like five minutes, and then she's like, okay, everyone share your experiences. What did you feel like? And they're like, Anirudh, what did you feel? And I was like, oh, what I felt was in my head, there was a curve that was going up, and going down and going up again and going down a bit more. They're like, what do you mean? It's like, you know, you were singing and you went Krishna. So I went up with that. And then you went to the softer notes. So I went Krishna and I went lower. And then I'm just trying to map what you're doing just because I want to sing nicely. Like, that's it. Like, we do all this heat and we invest all our emotions into this. And all that you're telling me is you're in your head, there was a curve going up, down, up, down. And I'm like, hmm, that's all I could see. And then she said, you know, what else do you think? I'm like, you know, the concept of God is very interesting. I'm like, no, I never, what do you mean by concept of God? God is not a concept. God is a person. I, I don't know what you're talking about. God is an amazing concept. So all this was to say that that's where I was. And now these people started to make sense to me slowly. But imagine the shock of my parents. They are like, he was an atheist. And he was doing just fine. And now suddenly he seems to have made a bunch of new friends. And somehow he's acting all religious. I'm like, oh, dad, I don't eat before offering food to Krishna. Like, what's happening with this guy? <laughs> you know, dad, onion and garlic are bad for you. They're thomas like, you shouldn't be doing this. That's like, this guy's lost the plot. Like, what's wrong with this guy? And the reason I bring it up is that, so because I was not confident enough. Now, remember, I said I was just learning. I'm still learning, but at that point, I knew nothing. 
accept those intuitive feelings. And for my parents, could, if they ask me like a really good question, I didn't have a good answer. And that can also be a practical problem sometimes. When you're trying to figure things out, you need the right company to help you figure things out. Otherwise, you get lost. You don't know what's going on. Like my parents were like, Anirudh, this is basically you just saying your PhD is getting a little hard and these people are very sweet and you just want to go hang out with them. That's what we think is happening. Because they're like, oh, but yeah, education is not so important. And you're like, yeah, that's the kind of messaging I want right now, now that my PhD is hard. But that wasn't the point. But they thought that was the point because I was still building my confidence. I was still learning. I was figuring things out. And so I wasn't in a position where I could question them. Or say, hey, here's what I think. Here's what I want to do. And so that's the other problem. Like influence to the point that Trisha, is that correct? No, I forgot. Yeah. What did I say? Is that your name or no? Yeah, my name. Okay, cool. I was worried because like <laughs> sometimes I freak out. I'm like, I very confidently say, you know, your name is good. And then you're like, ah, I was being nice. Yeah. His name I can't forget, but because he's under that so it's easy enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With the rest and Anyway, so, but going back, so um, this is another form of influence, right? Like, so basically, because I am not very clear, I'm still trying to figure things out, and I am with people who don't necessarily agree with me, they are applying this kind of opposite force, and I'm not ready yet for that. I'm still learning. And so that's the other problem, at least in my universe, with why I want to be very careful about who I'm hanging out with. In fact, this also happened at work. So, for example, when I was like, oh, I don't eat meat and stuff like that. And I'm like, why? I'm like, oh, not much. I don't, because it makes sense to me. I'm like, oh, did you never eat meat, Anil? I was like, no, I did. I did for a while. It was fun. It was fun while it lasted. And then I stopped. Like, how could you give up meat after you like really started liking this? I mean, who, who does that? Like, I do that. I am that person. Now, and it was funny because I used to give the same answer like over a period of time. Initially, people were like, they would feel very bad for me. They're like, Anirudh, you don't know what you're missing out on. Da, da, da. And then as time progressed, I started to see that because I was getting more confident, they were more like, oh, that's your choice. We respect that. But it takes a while to go from here to there. And in that process, a lot of things can go wrong. And that's why at least in my opinion, like this whole business of why we want to keep the right kind of company is really important. So far, so good. Kind of makes sense. Questions, comments, thoughts, concerns. I think this <laughs> huh? Oh, I'm not audible. At the back. Okay, fine. Is it on? Okay, can people have, oh crap, this is really loud. Can people hear me all right now? Yeah. Am I going to repeat myself for the past five yeah. minutes again? <laughs> okay. Hopefully at least enough was picked up at the moment. We are going to be But anyway, to reiterate, I think the company we keep is extremely important because number one, they can influence us. Number two, we pick up things from them. And then number three, because when I'm still trying to figure things out, if there is too much force applied the other way, that can kind of be distracting. It could break my confidence. It could do a bunch of things. And that's why keeping the right kind of company is important. That being said, though, is it practical really to only be with people who are my kind of people. Like if I'm a spiritualist or I'm a spiritual seeker, let's say I'm, I'm a bhatra, I'm trying to follow the path of bhakti yoga, can I just avoid everyone else? Is that practical? No, right? What do I do? So do I tell them like, hey, stay away from me, maintain a six feet distance, we are past COVID, but we are still maintaining a six feet distance because you and I have a very different value system. Will that work? Will that work for any of us? No, right? So then are we messing up then? Because Rupa Goswami, who seems to know a lot about what the do's and the don'ts are, 
is like, hey, don't hang out with these people, man. I'm telling you, this is going to mess things up for you. What are we missing here? So is it wrong? Is it right? It's kind of wrong, but I still do it because I think it's right. What's happening? I don't know. I don't have an answer. I'm asking you a question. Friends, you're associating for the sake of associating is different. You're just doing your job, you're just asking for your job, which is funny or something. One moment. Let me summarize the two and then we'll come to the other point. So you are saying that from a viewpoint of like not being too narrow minded, being able to expose yourself to different kinds of thinking and to be able to learn how to accept all kinds of thinking, independent of where I am, that is more viable. You're saying that as long as I have a way of staying kind of detached, but I'm not like too attached to like the people, it's kind of okay. Perhaps you're already open-minded. That's a very interesting viewpoint. I never thought about it that way. But that's fascinating, no? <laughs> if you are very clear about what we are and what we do, so if you are very clear about us and why we are doing a certain thing, then mingling or being with other people would not affect us. We would still see, if, if we want good from them, we would still uh, go and look into the good point or good attribute what that person has, and we might try uh, adapting that to ourselves. So that is that is why it is very important to meet different people, to notice the good things and take it and maybe improve ourselves. Yes, you had to add to that. Uh, <clears throat> what I think is uh, the one to step with, put towards what it is that you are seeking. So it's rather not uh, you know associating to a group of people per se. But if uh, you gravitate towards a certain group these right kind of people fall into your circle. You know, the, the people who don't share a certain pattern of what you're vibrating with, they just fall back. And you, before you even realize that you're already going to do it. And those two kind of go together, right? Because, Shreya, you were talking about, let me get that back again. Again, my insecure self is taking over. Okay, so I did get that. So you were talking about how if only I know what I'm doing, and if I'm very clear here, then this is not going to affect me. And you're building on that, and you're saying, if I'm actually clear here, the odds that I'm going to attract kind of people who will share similar values, similar goals, and so it's probably going to be natural. And you had a slightly like different addition to this, where you were saying that, well, all that is great, but also, even the people you don't get along with or people who you don't necessarily think share the same values with you, if there is a degree of detachment, we're kind of okay. Yeah, because my opinion is that it comes from the bhakti yoga itself, because I, that's what I feel like. Eventually, you're going to reach a point that you'll see Krishna in everyone. So it doesn't matter. You'll have compassion for everyone. So it won't be like, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to treat you separately. All the same. That's a different degree of detachment. Here's the marker. That's the whiteboard. I'm going to go sit there. You can take over. Because that's kind of where we would go anyway, right? So you already have it sorted. Go chill, do whatever it is that you want to do. Or help us out. I think you get everybody's right on the same path. So it's like uh, somebody who's training for, let's say you started boxing. So you're going to train for a while before you get into the ring with other potential people that are maybe. Uh, you know boxing a little bit better than you or have more experience, right? So you're not going to get in that ring until you're confident enough to be able to do that, right? So it's the same concept. So what he was saying is first you have to develop your, your belief system. So it's crazy <laughs> to walk into a ring before you're prepared. So prepare yourself just like anything else. And once you're prepared, it comes full circle because then you seek out opportunities to get in that ring. Maybe not an exact analogy, but the point is, once you establish those fundamentals, those deep beliefs of bhakti, actually, to your point, you start to see Krishna on everybody, and actually, you want to seek out the, um, and, and be able to bring Krishna to them, right? So you actually will want to do that. But in the interim, is that 
is is where you uh, you don't have your legs, if you will, you know, and you have to be very careful because you can also get distracted, right? And if you get knocked down, if you go into the ring prematurely and you get knocked down, it might be hard to get back up. Does that make sense, right? So that his point of my mom started asking me questions and I couldn't answer them. If that happens repeatedly, you start to question the philosophy of the dog. So you guys are 100 percent right. And as is usually the case when we are right, even the acharyas are, are on our side. <laughs> So uh, I just had a couple of things that I was that I noted and I was thinking about. So the first part, which is you guys were spot on when all of you said, yeah, you know, you can't really avoid being with people because, hey, you have a life to live. We have our duties to perform. And so we can't really run away from our duties. And Krishna says that multiple times in the Bhagavad Gita, he says, no, you know, you have to do your duty, perform your duty at Kripoise to Arjuna. Then he says it again. He says, you know, if uh, it's far better to discharge one's prescribed duties, so body than to do someone else's. So we have a job. We have something to do. We have a duty and we have to perform that and we're not going to be able to run away from it. So all this is to say you all have excellent gut feelings. Very nice. You knew already what Krishna was trying to explain to us, at least in this context. Now, as far as the other part is concerned, which I was really impressed when you were explaining, Rishab, is so Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who's another like really, really, really really amazing Vaishnava, also spoke about the same thing. So he said, when Rupa Goswami says, oh, you shouldn't be with worldly-minded people, he is not talking about engaging with them because you need to. He's talking about engaging with them because you want to. That's the difference he was trying to point out. He said, association with worldly-minded people doesn't mean that you're not going to engage with the world. It's about who you consciously choose. Am I consciously choosing people who are not conducive to my development of bhakti? If I'm consciously choosing them, that is a no-no. That is associating with worldly-minded people. But if I'm at work, if I'm doing other things, if I'm trying to talk to people because I need to, and if I have the right attitude, as a lot of you pointed out, it's important, in fact. It's not... We are not even in the nothing wrong territory. We are in the please do it territory because you need to you need to perform your duties. So, so far, so good. I think so far what we've talked about is a little bit along why is it that the company we keep is important from a spiritual standpoint. And then we realize, okay, being careful doesn't mean being detached. Okay. So now I had a couple of, so I was thinking about what else could I say? And then I started thinking about well, okay, so Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, hmm, the ones you choose should be the ones who should help you cultivate your bhakti. Another story now. So back in the day when I started going to the temple about, whatever, ten, eight, nine years ago. So remember, for context, I was a PhD student. I was trying to get a PhD in physics. I was like, science, yay, science, yay, facts, yay, rationality. Kind of guy. So I walked into the temple. And there is like this you know, really, really lovely person who I got to know as time progressed. And in an entirely different context, he was saying, you know, people keep doing all this research, but all this research is actually useless. Because Krishna already has given us all the answers. We are just trying to remake whatever, rediscover whatever Krishna has already told us. So you know what? I don't know why people do research. It's useless. Imagine, you're like a third-year PhD student, you're trying to find your thesis problem and everything, and you walk in and this lovely person here, who you know is a lovely person, is saying, yeah, what you're basically doing is kind of pointless. What do you do? Spiritualist? Yes. Extremely respected spiritualist? Yes. They were not saying anything wrong. They didn't mean to say anything wrong. They were talking in an entirely different context. Technically, they're supposed to help me grow spiritually. I'm in the temple. Still not working. They are spiritual, okay? but somehow something is not working. Yes, my dear. I would actually see it in a way where, you know, uh, like I can create a circumstance. So, yes, everything is already there in a certain way in our uh, scriptures. However, what you were doing, 
in, in a way, you know, rediscovering or like, I'm just speculating, speculating, like saying that you were doing something along those lines, but uh, kind of representing the same thing in a scientific way that people of this day and age could relate to. I mean, I think that in, in essence, the conclusion would have been the same thing of any research. It's just that the representation is different. It's the mathematics, the physics, or it's more tangible. Which makes sense in that particular context. In addition, the larger question I was asking is that is every spiritual seeker the same kind of person? And because we are all on the same path of bhakti, is there a rule that says that we are all supposed to be besties? That's my question to you. And if you say no, then are we again in the, is this okay or am I messing this up territory? I haven't come with a lot of answers today. I've only come with a bunch of questions, by the way. Because the answers will come. That's the whole point of this. This is Gita, which is discussion. Yes. I mean, just, just like with choosing who you want to associate with, who will help you develop your bhakti, and associating with these mundane worldly people for the need of it for your deed, to perform your deity. Um, even in even in your spiritual practice, I've felt that there are certain people that are very inspiring and do like help you connect with Krishna a lot more and a lot easier. And I mean, everyone does have their own nature, so you're definitely going to connect with certain spiritual people better than you do others, and there's definitely nothing wrong with it. So I, I think it's the same. You can choose who you associate with in the spiritual. It's not necessary to connect well with everyone. It isn't that by default every bhakta, everyone on the bhakti yogi is my kind of bhakti yogi. There are different forms that I have to make it the way, but we have a So, so Sitsananda Maharaj was asked this question, and he was asked this question. Um, the question was, you know, some of these stories in the Bhagavad were so fantastic. Like, it's they're so hard to believe. There's no way this stuff happened. Like, there's no way. And, uh, you know, and uh, Sitchin and Maharaj got really, like, introspective. And his answer was, he goes, you know, spirituality is so deep, bhakti is so deep, that if a story resonates with a Mataji in Vrindavan who's a widower, and that's all she cares about. She loves the story, listens to it, and it inspires her. So be it. But if you're an intellectual and you want to get to the understanding step by step of what spirituality really means and what it takes to mean to get to Krishna, that is also there. So instead of saying, oh my God, there's no way this could be right with this story, you can look at it as it's, everything's there for us in the, in, the, in the Vedas, right? In our scriptures. So that kind of answers your question too. He will resonate, or the way he would seek out bhakti would be a little bit different than somebody saying, who needs research? Who needs research? When you have Krishna's blessings, you don't need it. I'm not saying it's me, but me sitting in there, it may just resonate, say, yeah, my gosh, why am I wasting my time? I should be cultivating completely my bhakti, right? Does that make sense for everybody? Like, there's so much in there, Krishna will attract you. That's why he's called attractive, the all attractive. He will attract you the way that you want to be attracted. And that's the point. The point is that I think I heard from someone that like even like spiritual seekers, spiritualists, they're like a bouquet of flowers. Like, you know, you have all these different kinds of flowers. They're all flowers, but they're all of different kinds. And the reason I bring this up is that at least for me, when I use, even now, like not from before, but even now, when I see a rule, it freaks me out. When I see someone says, don't do this, it freaks me out. So if, you know, the, the injunction says, don't associate with worldly minded people, I'm freaking out sitting there reading it. And that's the reason I wanted to point this out. What I wanted to point out is one, that as much as 
the guidance is be careful. The guidance is not that by default, you have to be with everyone you don't think you resonate with just because they seem to share your goals. It's totally fine to be respectful of them. Find the folks that you connect with and then grow together. It's totally fine. At least in my world, it's totally fine. And I think, so that's one part. And then the other part I wanted to say before I close out on this is that Prabhupada, again, in Bhagavad Gita, in one point, in one of the purpose, he says, you know, even this whole process of bhakti, it's not abrupt. It's gradual. Which also means that giving ourselves some grace is important. There may be many connections, many relationships, many friendships that you've cultivated over many, many years. Just because they don't seem to resonate on one particular level, at one particular plane with you anymore, doesn't mean that they're just getting chopped off your list now. It's probably very hard. It's super taxing. And it's probably not worth it, at least in my opinion. Gradual. Prabhupada says gradual. And that goes back to the point you were making. What's your name, by the way? Abhilash. That goes back to the point Abhilash was making, which is that as I get clearer, the folks around me also start to change. So either the ones who really respect my choices, they'll stay with me. We may not do the same things, but they'll respect my choices. But they'll gradually move on. But if I were to abruptly try to change things, odds are it's going to get very tricky very quickly. And probably not the best thing to do, at least in my opinion. I don't know. What do you all think? I was strongly considering like telling Karthik we can't be friends anymore because I read this and I have to prepare for this and you're a distraction. But then I realized this. <laughs> That's what friends do. They give you burns. Even when, well, always, right? There is no even when. That's their job. Their job is to give you burns. Your best friends are the ones where you're like, why is this person my friend? But then they're your best friend. Can I also share, um, as we start on this spiritual path, right? Like we started it last year in the fall, the spiritualist journey. And so if you're truly following the spiritual path of chanting, you know, the devotional service, the different processes of devotional service, if you're doing those things, Krishna reveals himself within your heart to be able to differentiate whether Shriya is worth hanging out or not. Is she a bad influence on me or not? Sometimes our intellectually, we may be like, oh, yeah, Shriya is fine. But in your heart, says, something's not adding up here with her, right? So that's the beautiful part about spirituality. It's mystical. It's romanticism. It's the reason you should be on this path, and I mentioned this so many, is to transform yourself. It's it's to think in a different way than you've been, you've, been taught, you've been taught how to think. And so the beautiful part is, as you're on this journey, these questions in a vacuum are hard to discern, right? It's like, do I hang around with this person? Or do I not hang around with this person? Well, we have to be careful we don't start to apply our material thinking, right? Because we have to apply spiritual thinking to spiritual these, to these issues. And so the best way to do it is, if you're following the other paths, this becomes very easy to be able to discern. Krishna's talking if only we are listening. Krishna's talking. The question is, are we listening? And as we listen, he's always been talking. He's been explaining things. We just, oh, yeah, whatever. But as time progresses, we start to hear, we start to listen, we start to understand, and then things start to take care of themselves. And that's the point I was really trying to make, is that let's not trick ourselves into making any drastic changes, because usually drastic changes are very, very unproductive. And Rav, can you also expand on, you know, your thing that also about a gradual process yeah. instead of an abrupt process? Yeah. So when you think of somebody who's on a spiritualist path or somebody who's, you know, like really, really involved with uh, religiosity, and if they make a mistake, what's your first thought? Be honest, right? If they make a mistake or they, they're caught doing something bad, you know, or something like that, what's your first thought? You're fake. Yeah. He's fake. Yeah. Oh, my God, I thought he was this 
this you know elevated person, he was all fake of the whole time, right? That's our first thought. It's the same concept that is gradual. You are supposed to make mistakes on this spiritual journey. That's what he was saying, right? You're supposed to slip and fall constantly in the beginning, right? Constantly. So it doesn't mean you're not on your spiritual path. It's you're just learning. You're growing. You're, yeah. you're getting better. The question is, am I a little further ahead than I was yesterday? Yeah. That's all there is to it. It's... Reflecting back and looking into yourself, but not many people actually reflect or introspect themselves. They are like, they just go by the way they go. We either live life mindlessly and we don't know what's going on, or we live a little more mindfully and things make a little more sense than they do on average. But that's, but you're, but you're right. I mean, none of this stuff is going to make sense if we don't introspect, if we don't reflect, if we don't take time for it. We're not making any progress. We're we're making some progress, but then the question is: Is it is it sustainable? And probably the answer is it is not. So all this is to say that yes, choose carefully. But even amongst a group that is supposed to be awesome, there will still be some people you connect with. Some not as much. That is okay. Part one. Part two. It's a gradual journey. It's not that we are advocating for abruptly making changes. Probably not worth it. Slow and steady is a lot better. And it's intuitively obvious. We all heard. We all heard the story, right? The hair and the flowers. So we know. We know this. We know this is how it's supposed to work. So that was that. And then the final part that I wanted to bring up. My final question. Like I said, I don't have any answers. I come with a bunch of questions. If only I did that as a PhD, I think it would have been a lot more fun, but okay, that's done. That's in the past. Uh, the final question is, okay, okay, Rupa Goswami, you said don't do this. Other acharyas expanded on it. We've heard a bunch of things. All this makes sense. But what about outreach? What about all these people who seem to be going out sharing the joy of Krishna consciousness with all these super, super worldly minded people wherever they are, including St. Patrick's Day. What are they missing? Are they, do these people not know what they're doing? Did they not get the memo? Like, did they not know that they shouldn't? They're speaking out actively, all these, like, you know, worldly minded people and going and hanging out with them and Telling them, hey, have you heard about the Bhagavad Gita? Here's philosophy. Have you ever thought about these things? They're, they're proactively seeking all these worldly minded people. What about that? Would it be like the intention? Because the whole point, I think, of not associating with material people is to not distract us from our goal of bhakti. But now, if we're associating with them with the intention of, you know, helping them realize bhakti or helping them realize Krishna consciousness, the best thing we can do. Because essentially they will slowly become like-minded people that we can associate with or that we can help along their journey. But, 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 but what if I become like that? If you're giving association, you're not taking it. Yeah. For those who didn't hear in the back, that was very cool. <laughs> He said you're giving association, but you're not taking it. So you're sharing, but you've turned your receiver off, at least for certain things. Obviously, you're aware of how they're feeling, what they're doing, and all that. You're not trying to learn from them. It's going kind of one way when you're trying to share with them. That's one part of it. Other thoughts? I had a couple of thoughts myself, but question time is sometimes the time. That makes a lot of sense to me. I think that's really cool. In addition, what I was thinking about and what I wanted to suggest is that even for a lot of these people who actually like great acharyas who gone ahead and spoken and tried to positively influence all these people in the world, they also did not take their job very easy. Hira Prabhupada was 69 when he came to the United States. 
and he wrote a lot of books. He knows what he's talking about. He is very, very, very strong as an Acharya, as a devotee. In fact, he did not need to prepare. Still, he chose to prepare. So he exercised caution. Wasn't like, I feel ready. Let's go. Let's teach these people what the right thing is. Huh? He was more like, oh, I wonder whether they'll get it. My teacher says it's a good idea. He even wrote the Jaladuta prayers, which were partly thinking about this. He's like, how will I convince all these people in America that what they're doing doesn't make sense? So even the best, they're very humble about this. Even when they do it, it's not like they're coming in with the attitude of, let me tell you what you don't know, and I know everything there is to be known. That's usually not what they're doing. They're thinking more along the lines of, oh, let's share something, which this seems to have worked for us. Maybe it will work for you too, which is kind of in the spirit of what Girish was saying. And so they're not really messing anything up. And now the question comes, okay, when do I get to do that? So that's a different question. It's a bit of introspection. It's a bit of the, the nice triangle of the people you look up to, the people around you, and scripture. Well, that triangle aligns on the idea that, huh, now is a good time for you to maybe start sharing because, hey, the best way to learn is to share. Then you're like, okay, maybe it is a good time after all. I don't know, but maybe it is. People seem to suggest it's a good time. Let me try it out. And what's also interesting about that, and I'll probably wrap up with this, is that one of the fun things about like a lot of these rules and the do's and the don'ts is that Initially, it seems like it's being very restrictive. But once you get the purpose behind it, you're good, usually. And so a lot of times, like these do's and don'ts in my head, they function like they're trying to give you what is the quote unquote safest path to get somewhere. They also know that that's probably not going to work out just the way they suggested it's going to work out. Odds are you're going to make all these little detours along the way but they don't say it. It's like our parents, right? They're like, hey, do this, do that, do this, do that. They know for a fact we are not about to do everything that they told us. They know, they, they're saying it out of affection for us. I know, don't do this, because we think you're going to suffer. Deep within, they also know that probably I'll be a lot wiser if only I tried it out and figured it out. But their love for me is so much that they want to make sure that I don't have to go through that painful process. It's the same with our Acharyas too. They love us so much that they give us all these principles. They say, absolutely, do not even think about this. But that's not the point. The point is it's coming from a place of love. And when I understand why it is that I'm being told what I'm being told, you have to play around with the rules a little bit. Not in a way where I violate rules, that's not what I'm advocating for, but in a way where I understand like what the boundary is. What am I doing? What's right? How does this make sense? How does everything fit together? Da, da, da. And that's, and this is where I shut up. I'm done. I am done. And if you have questions, please ask. I 
So just a couple of announcements. If you could have volunteers, three volunteers to Have fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming to us. Thank you. 